Last week I prepared my work for today. I spoke of things we know and yet cannot tell. I told you of a doctor who could recognize the characteristic appearance of a disease but could not tell what the particulars were by which he recognized it. I said that whatever we explicitly know by attending to it is in fact the meaning of particulars of which we are tacitly aware and to which we are accordingly not attending in themselves. But I said also that we can often identify such particulars, though perhaps not fully, and that we even can switch our attention to them. We then look at them directly in themselves and accordingly no longer rely on them for attending to their joint meaning. In other words, by concentrating our attention on a set of particulars, we lose sight of the comprehensive whole which they are forming. This comprehensive entity vanishes and our very knowledge of its existence may be destroyed. Today, I will suggest that this is how scientific analysis can destroy reality. It arrives at absurd conclusions, such as I have cited in my first lecture, by insisting on analyzing all complex entities in terms of its more tangible particulars. But I intend to go well beyond this negative statement. To lose sight of a comprehensive entity by focusing on its particulars is not merely a misleading way of looking at the entity. It is, I suggest, to ignore the organizing forces by which the particulars are combined to such an entity. The tacit process by which we comprehend a meaning must then be recognized as the faculty for perceiving the organizing principles by which comprehensive entities are constituted. By this faculty, we can study these principles and realize that when they operate on a set of particulars, they elevate the level of reality on which the disjointed particulars exist to a higher level of reality on which the comprehensive entities exist. The entities within which the particulars are meaningfully joined together. We shall see the universe then as a series of rising levels, each of which can be structurally related to those below it and above it by principles derived from the nature of the tacit act by which each of the consecutive levels of reality are known to us. My first example for demonstrating the existence of two consecutive levels of reality of which the higher one contains certain comprehensive entities and the lower contains their parts, will be of no great interest in itself to this audience. Yet I shall choose it because it is homely and clear and I can promise you that we shall presently move on to more vital cases on which the lessons of our example will immediately shed light. The two levels of reality that I shall first identify will both lie in the domain of inanimate matter. The upper level will be composed of machines. Every kind of machine, from typewriters to motor cars, and from telephones to pendulum clocks, are to be collected here and each in all possible variations. 
as to the lower level, it will consist of the parts of machines seen in themselves as mere inanimate objects, all mixed up with the other inanimate objects of the world. Let me show first that machines on the one hand and their parts as mere inanimate bodies on the other hand are the subjects of two distinct sciences. Machines are studied by mechanical engineering, inanimate bodies by physics and chemistry. A class of machines, say clocks or watches, is characterized by common features which say little or nothing about their physical, chemical composition. There exists an infinite variety of materials of which watches or clocks can conceivably be made. And it is wrong to define watches or clocks in terms which would exclude the use of any of these conceivable materials. The definition which truly establishes the characteristic reality of a machine, be it a typewriter, a motor car, a watch or a clock, consists in its operational principles. Such a principle states the purpose of the machine, the function of the parts of it it is composed, and the way they interact in achieving their purpose. Such is the definition, such the conception of a machine. If you invent a new machine, you will define it in the terms of its operational principles, and you may claim a patent founded on this description of it. You will carefully avoid, in asking for a patent, any reference to the material of which you have made such a machine, or think you could best make it. For if you do this, your patent could be circumvented by a competitor making your machine from some other material. You would, in fact, have failed to define in all its generality the class of objects comprised by the conception of your machine. Look now, on the other hand, at the parts of a machine as inanimate objects. Take a watch to pieces and examine, however carefully, each separate part in turn. And you will never come across the principles by which the watch keeps time. Let loose an army of physicists and chemists to analyze and describe in minute detail an object which you want to identify as a machine. That is, you don't know whether it's a machine or not. And you will find that they can never tell in terms of physics or chemistry, whether the object is a machine, and if so, what purpose it serves and how. This corresponds to the obvious fact that textbooks of physics and chemistry do not deal with the purposes served by machines, while the science of engineering speaks at length, at length of these purposes. Engineering deals with communication, locomotion, heating, lighting, spinning, weaving, and hundreds of other manufactures, and hence can deal also with the way these purposes are achieved by the aid of machines, while physics and chemistry know nothing of such purposes and so can form no conception of machines at all. I shall try now to tell you more about what I call the logical relation between the two consecutive levels of reality that we have before us in the case of machines and of their parts as mere inanimate objects. This will turn out to be typical of the relationship between consecutive levels of reality and will therefore reveal the principle by which we can envisage an indefinite succession of such levels right up to the level of responsible human beings. I have said that the machine can be defined only by its operational principle, which principle tells us what it is for and how it works. This clearly implies also that the machine is something that can fail to work, that can get out of order, but it says nothing more and can say nothing more about machines that have gone wrong. 
It cannot say what may cause a machine to break down. To understand the failures of a machine, we must descend to an inquiry of the lower level formed by the parts of the machine as mere inanimate bodies. In other words, we must call in physics and chemistry and examine the parts by the methods of these sciences. But this must be a particular kind of physics and chemistry, namely a physics and chemistry expressly bearing on the operational principles of the machine. In this ancillary role, which is called applied physics and chemistry, these sciences can supply the information necessarily ignored by the operational principles of a machine, are the principles which you would put into a pattern to cover the machine. And this, this kind of physical chemical investigation enables engineers to establish the best conditions for the construction of a machine and for its working and to learn to avoid its breakdown. We see then two branches of science referring to the two levels of reality comprised in a machine. They are, firstly, the science of operational principles, which I shall call pure engineering, and secondly, physics come chemistry with a definite bearing on the operations of machines. The status of these two branches of knowledge is far from symmetrical. The practical identification of a machine must come first, and no amount of physical and chemical testing can achieve this identification. Mechanical engineering alone reveals the true nature of a machine. By understanding its purpose and the rational means which the machine offers for achieving this purpose. The physical and chemical topography of a machine is, by itself, meaningless. This corresponds exactly to the way we comprehend a meaningful entity by relying on our tacit awareness of its particulars. The comprehensive entity owes its existence to the existence of the particulars and our knowledge of it is a comprehension of these particulars. And the particulars lose their meaning when we attend to them focally in themselves. They form the comprehensive entity only by their bearing on it. And what is more, they are identifiable only, if at all, by first recognizing the comprehensive entity which they constitute. The importance of, importance of this last conclusion will become apparent in a moment. And now we can turn to subjects of more immediate concern to this inquiry. What I have said of machines applies likewise to the machine-like aspects of animals. It is questionable to what extent living beings can be represented by machines. But there can be no doubt that the animal body does function in many respects as a machine. A great number of patterns could be taken out on the operational principles of such organs as the heart, the lungs, or the eye, if these instruments were newly invented today. This is all we need for the moment to become aware of a very curious fact, namely that physiologists unanimously consider the machine-like operations of the body to be explicable in terms of physics and chemistry. To offer a mechanistic explanation of living beings is taken to be synonymous with offering an explanation in terms of physics and chemistry. Now this is the exact opposite of what I have just proven for machines themselves. Are we then to reject as a logical error the claims of biologists that in explaining living beings as mechanisms, they are explaining the functions of the organism in physical, chemical terms? Yes, that is precisely what we have to do. The idea incessantly broadcast throughout biological literature that the purpose of scientific biology is to explain life in terms of physics and chemistry 
is strictly meaningless. This error is admittedly rendered harmless in the practice of biology by the fact that biologists never actually tried to explain the functions of living beings in terms of physics and chemistry. What they actually do is to establish the principles by which the healthy organism operates, principles which insofar as they are mechanical have the same logical structure as those of pure engineering. These principles define the functioning of various bodily organs for the joint achievement of certain bodily purposes. No physical or chemical analysis of a living body can express these operational principles, since neither bodily purposes nor functioning organs can be expressed in terms of physics or chemistry. Far from offering a complete understanding of life, a complete physico-chemical topography of an organism would be quite meaningless, just as that of a machine. Physiology is advanced by physical or chemical investigations only if undertaken with a bearing on previously known or surmised operational principles of a living being. Physico-chemical investigations can only seek to determine the ways in which some previously recognized functions of an organism are performed and to detect the causes of their dysfunction. Otherwise, they contribute nothing to biology. I repeat, therefore, that the declarations of biologists that they will explain all living beings in terms of physics and chemistry is logically absurd. Biologists should recognize their great achievements for what they are and reject on these grounds the conception of the scientific method derived from a misunderstanding of the exact sciences. In doing so, they would not only liberate themselves from false pretenses, but may induce physicists and chemists themselves to correct on similar lines the conception of their own methods which they currently hold. We can finally settle accounts here with the Laplacian ideal of universal knowledge. Suppose we had a complete atomic map of the world for all times. What this would tell about a living being? What would this tell about a living being? Say a living frog. We cannot ask any question about living frogs unless we know about frogs first and are even able to tell, at least roughly, whether a frog is dead or alive. Without the anterior knowledge of these comprehensive features, no Laplacian investigation of living frogs could ever be started. And even so, the information supplied by the Laplacian mind would mean nothing unless we could discern from it such comprehensive features like the existence of different organs and their functions. And we could do so only by identifying the shapes and patterns of organs within the atomic topography. And for this, we should have to rely on the same faculty for discerning comprehensive entities by relying on our awareness of their particulars, which physiologists normally use when making observations on animals. An atomic knowledge of the world would only make this infinitely more difficult. Harvey would never have discovered the circulation of the blood if he had had to start from an atomic map of living beings. And, assuming for the sake of argument that the super Harvey would have achieved this feat, he would have done so by the same faculties by which Harvey guessed how the blood is being pumped by the heart into the arteries and flows back into it from the veins. In fact, neither the conception of the frog nor that of the heart nor the arteries, the veins and the blood flowing through them can be expressed in terms of atomic coordinates any more than a machine can be defined in these terms. And the same is true, of course, for our primroses. So we can now see finally 
where Laplacian computation of the future position of atoms next spring can say nothing about flowering of primroses at that date. No, indeed, tell us anything else that is of interest to us. It also may be uh, becoming apparent that our analysis of the logical relation between two consecutive levels of reality has equipped us with a mode of reasoning by which we may be able to destroy systematically the typical fallacies engendered in the modern mind by a false ideal of science. The building up of further consecutive levels of reality right up to that of morally responsible men will show how this task of liberation of the modern mind can be continued further. The next higher level of reality to which I shall now ascend, leaving out for the moment some intermediate levels, is that formed by the active behavior of animals, or men for that matter. We meet here with individuals, individuals governed by an active center. The center coordinates the animal's actions which follow its perceptions and satisfy its drives. This motoric, appetitive, perceptive agency is invariably endowed, even at the lowest levels of animal life, with the faculty of learning. And the experimental study of learning in animals has been for half a century a major preoccupation of psychological research in laboratories. Pavlov's experiments on dogs have evoked a mighty movement for interpreting all behavior, including that of man, in mechanical terms. This interpretation was first formulated in America by Watson's behaviorism about 50 years ago and was upheld since with some variations by many influential works, such as Clark L. Hull's Fundamental Treatise, published 20 years ago, and in our own days by B.F. Skinner's writings in issued from Harvard. These inquiries are dominated by the determination to represent all behavior, and particularly the process of learning in terms of a mechanical model, and to avoid, above all, the kind of anthropomorphism which would explain the animal's reactions by considering what we ourselves would do in its place if in, we would be put in its place. It is held that only, only by exercising such detachment of disregarding any such consideration of what we would do in the animal's place can the inquiry made be truly scientific. In my opinion, it is, on the contrary, only by indwelling that we can understand at all anything about an animal's behavior. You might remember that by acknowledging our body as the center of all tacit awareness, I suggested that tacit awareness is a kind of indwelling and that this makes intelligible the way we understand the internal meaning of music and pure mathematics, these I mentioned on that occasion. Now, the manner of relying on our tacit awareness of particulars for comprehending their joint internal meaning will prove to be the way for identifying the active center of an intelligent animal or man. So let me illustrate this on an example from animal psychology. Take the standard experiment of a rat running a maze. It is found that as a result of repeated trials, the rat gets to know its way about the maze. Since the particulars of the knowledge acquired by the rat are unspecifiable, the psychologist's knowledge that the rat has learned the maze is unspecifiable at least to the same extent. What happens is, in fact, that at some moment, the rat's behavior begins to show that it has grasped the topography of the maze because it is behaving in a fashion similar to that which we ourselves, equipped with the rat's sense organs, would behave if we had just begun to know our way about the maze. The understanding, the understanding of the process of learning 
by dwelling within the unspecifiable manifestation of an animal's intelligence is, of course, only one instance in the way indwelling makes us aware of the animal's active center. The same process also operates at earlier primitive levels. It is indwelling alone that can make us aware of the animal's sentience, and we owe, therefore, our entire knowledge of the appetites and perceptive powers of animals to our capacity for indwelling. So we may conclude that the behavior is teaching that in observing an animal, we must strictly refrain from imagining that we would, what we would do, from imagining what we would do if placed in the animal's position is false. Nothing at all could be known about an animal that would be of the slightest interest to physiology and still less to psychology, except by following the opposite maxim, namely of identifying ourselves with the center of action in the animal and criticizing its performance by standards set up for it by ourselves. And we may add that, in spite of their declared repudiation of this method, all significant results obtained by behaviorists themselves are, in fact, based primarily on this very method. Individuals acting purposefully under the control of an internal center form a distinctive level of reality. This level, situated above the physiological level of automatic functions, which I described as the machine-like operations of living beings. I have explained there how physiological functions are rooted, just as the operations of the machine, in an even lower level of reality, which is controlled by the laws of physics and chemistry. Laws that say nothing of purposes and of rational means for achieving these, and are indeed blind to the very conception of success or failure. So we now see three levels of reality successively placed on top of each other. From the lowest inanimate level, we ascended to that of living beings functioning automatically, that is to the vegetative or physiological level. And from this, we ascended to a third level controlled by the animal's motoric, sentient, intelligent center. Remember, remember that the first ascent from the inanimate to the living endowed matter with the capacity for going wrong, which it previously did not possess. The next step, which we have just defined, has a similarly tragic success. By rising from the physiological to the actively centered, sensitive, and intelligent level, life acquires new faculties together with entirely new liabilities to go wrong. An animal controlled by his perceptions and drives can fall into error. We could never impute error to our intestines or lungs. Their functions can go wrong, but they cannot fall into error. In this respect, the level of reality on which error becomes possible is rooted in the lower level of physiological functions in exactly the same manner as physiological functions are rooted in their turn in the inanimate matter. But I shall not go into this now, for it can be left until later, and I shall survey the whole succession of levels up to the highest level of reality which we shall meet in the human mind. Man's mind has, of course, much in common with that of the animal. It is a center of senses and perception and of the various drives which we share with the animals. It is also the center of an intelligence, but one that is much more developed than that of the animal. Owing to his higher intelligence, man has the power of thought. We know a man's thoughts by a similar process of indwelling by which we comprehend a rat's intelligence. But the greater importance of man as compared with rats 
justifies us in describing this indwelling in some detail. When we watch a man's face and try to fathom his thoughts, we do not exam uh, examine his several features in isolation, but view them jointly as parts of his physiognomy. Thus we are aware of far more particulars and relations between particulars than we could identify. It is generally impossible, therefore, to keep track of a man's mental manifestations except by watching them as clues to the mind, to the mind from which they originate. It is always the mind itself that we know primarily. Any knowledge of its workings is derivative, and even so, these particulars remain rather vague and largely unidentifiable. This proves that the program of behaviorism, which proposes to study the workings of the mind in themselves, without reference to the mind, is totally impracticable. It shows also that the linguistic analysis of the mind performed by Professor Ryle is mistaken. Ryle tries to avoid Cartesian dualism of mind and body, and with it also behaviorism, by identifying the mind with the workings of the mind. He say the mind is the workings of the mind. But this assumes once more that we can identify the workings of the mind in themselves, which is not the case. We can recognize them only as pointers to the mind that works them. To say that the workings of the mind, of which we are aware as the mind, are the mind, is to commit the same logical mistake as to say that the word table, which signifies a table, is a table. But this does not yet explicitly vindicate the reality of the human mind. For this vindication, I must refer back to what I have said about the reality at the end of my last lecture. I spoke there of the kind of foreknowledge which is present in any knowledge of the truth. True knowledge, I said, is fraught with surmises. It is an inexhaustible mine of still hidden implications, and it conveys this awareness of its yet undiscovered consequences because it is but an aspect of something that lies beyond it, an aspect of reality. Thus, I defined reality as that to which true knowledge points and which yet may reveal itself further by an indeterminate range of future manifestations. I want to show now that according to this definition, all the centers of individuality are real, and this will entail a quick survey of the levels of reality in living beings, of which I have mentioned so far only two. Even when contemplating merely their shapes, living beings can be identified only in terms that attribute success or failure to them as individuals. On this lowest, morphological level, the center of individuality is still very weak. It becomes more accentuated stage by stage as we ascend to higher levels, first to the vegetative level of physiological functions, then that of active sentience and appetitive behavior, and then again to the level of intelligence and inventiveness, finally reaching the level of responsible human person. Each higher level is more real than the lower, for each higher one is expected to reveal itself in a new and ever wider range of indeterminate manifestations. And by these standards, the human mind is perhaps the most real thing in the world. Looking at all this from another angle, we see that each higher level of reality, endowed with additional unspecifiable faculties, incurs thereby additional risks to which lower levels are not liable. The inanimate realm from which all life has originally arisen is honoring and deathless. 
Life as it, at its very lowest level is endowed with the wondrous capacity for growth by which plants and animals acquire their typical shapes. But this gift brings with it the liability to miscarry by producing malformations. Next, ascending to the level of physiological functions, we find that the organism has become subject to disabling and eventually mortal diseases. And as we have seen, the still higher functions of perception, drive satisfaction and learning bring with them the capacity for falling into error. Man's higher level of intelligence makes him naturally liable to far greater errors than an animal can make. When reading the works of great thinkers, I sometimes wonder whether human fate would not be safer, safer in the hands of lesser men. Men of genius can persuade us of any fallacy. And man is not only liable to far greater errors than animals, he is also prone of, to failures of an entirely new kind. He alone is capable of evil. But it is too early to go into this here. I have to speak first of the peculiar instrument by the use of which alone man is made intellectually superior to the animal. I have mentioned in an earlier lecture that problem solving is always an indwelling and an assimilation of the known in order to look through it at the unknown or for the unknown. The superiority of man's intelligence over that of the animal is due almost entirely to another kind of indwelling the dwelling of his mind in language. Experiments have shown that the tacit powers of a child before it learns to speak hardly exceeds those of a chimpanzee of the same age. The intelligence curves of the two go on rising about the same rate until, when it learns to speak, the curve of the child goes up soaring far beyond that of the animal. Since words make sense in an infinite number of ways, language gives man access to an unlimited range of meanings unknown to the animal. But even the highest animals show faint, uh, only very faint traces of this highest level of reality. Chimpanzees show their intellectual pleasure in a trick originally invented for hauling in a banana. They use it as a game, applying it to stones or other useless things. The nervous breakdown of a dog confronted with signals ambiguously pointing to food or no food is out of proportion with the dog's interest in food. It seems to arise from the intellectual fascination of a puzzling situation. But the range of such intellectual passions is increased is increased myriadfold in a mind growing up in an articulate culture. Human culture is an edifice of passionate thought, reared by the force of the passions to which its erection offered creative scope, and continuing to foster and gratify these same passions. Young men and women pour their minds into this fabric so as to acquire the thoughts and live the emotions which it teaches them. And they transmit these in their turn to succeeding generations on whose response the edifice relies for its continued existence. By contrast to the satisfaction of appetites, the enjoyment of culture creates no scarcity in the objects offering gratification, but widens, on the contrary, their availability to others. Those who obtain such goods increase their universal supply by teaching others to enjoy them. And the pupil is no detached observer of the lesson to which he attends, nor even an equal partner to it. He submits to its voice, commanding his respect. We have clearly arrived here at the level overarching the faculties of any individual human mind, a level which we recognize as real insofar as we acknowledge the intrinsic powers of human thought. 
the relation of individual minds to this domain of transcendent thought will be the subject of my last lecture on Friday. And since this relationship includes to a large extent the subject of human responsibility, I shall have to carry forward this matter also to that meeting. So much the better, for I feel like one of those mountain guides who hustle their flock of tourists up to a peak without giving them a chance to look around. Let us stop here to ask ourselves how far we have actually got towards a vindication of reality, of the destruction of which I have spoken in my first lecture. The conception of reality has emerged as the correlate of a new conception of knowing. If knowing is an act of comprehending the meaning of clues and particulars to which we are not attending in themselves, then knowing does not refer primarily to any object. It does so only if the things which function as clues or particulars happen to reveal a single comprehensive object. We have seen that, for example, there is no single object in view when we contemplate a general conception. In any case, our interpretative powers cannot comprehend a meaningful entity without looking beyond this entity. Our confidence in holding our knowledge of it to be true points beyond it. For whenever we accept the statement as true, we say that it refers to an aspect of a reality which may yet manifest itself in an indeterminate range of yet unthinkable ways. We might look also in a more general way at the manner in which a higher level of reality is rooted in a lower one. And I should call this rootedness a logical relationship because it is a relation of meanings. In the higher level of a comprehensive entity, there lies a meaning which is absent in the next lower level. But the higher meaning exists only by its actualization within the lower level. This actualization is granted to it at a price, at a price. The lower medium which makes the operation of a comprehensive entity possible limits its scope and may cause its destruction. This bearing of the lower level on the higher level can of course be recognized only by virtue of some prior knowledge of the higher level. No study of the particulars of a comprehensive entity in themselves can ever represent the entity. Neurologists deny the, who deny the existence of consciousness and students of anthropology or history who pretend to be blind to the distinction between right and wrong do so for they feel obliged by the standards of science to represent comprehensive entities objectively in terms of their particulars, and this is impossible. But we have yet to familiarize ourselves, to conclude, with our own position in face of this universe of many levels of reality. The great German poet, Rainer Maria Rilke, has said that man has become a stranger in our interpreted universe. He meant the universe as interpreted by science. I believe that if we reflect on the way we henceforth should attend to reality from its lowest to its highest levels, we shall experience a veritable housewarming in this universe of revindicated realities. The mistaken ideal of science, which I had charged with the wholesale destruction of reality, has relied for its conception of knowledge on the process by which inanimate matter is observed. This was supposed to represent the purely descriptive, strictly value-free scientific knowledge. These claims are actually false. It is true that the laws of mechanics are strict, but any application of these laws to experience requires that we assess the nature of observed deviations from it. We must judge whether they are purely random or show some kind of order. The application of the laws of mechanics to experience takes place in a penumbra of experimental deviations, each of which has to be accounted for in terms of order or randomness 
if the laws of physics are to make contact with experience. That in spite of these valuations of order and randomness, which enter into our knowing of the inanimate, we may agree that this knowing is relatively impersonal. We may then distinguish between the observational knowing of the inanimate and our knowing of living things in which our judgment of rightness becomes more detailed and more emphatic. For we cannot identify a plant or an animal except by judging whether it has the right shape as judged by the standards which we consider appropriate to its species. The, this critical attitude, which the biologist necessarily assumes towards his object, becomes even more elaborate as we ascend from morphology to the study of the organs and their functions sustaining the life of the animal or plant. All the beautiful discoveries of physiology present as many standards by which to distinguish normal from abnormal functioning of living beings. And as we rise further to the level at which an animal is seen to coordinate its motions, to perceive the world outside, and to seek satisfaction of its appetites, this criticism implied in biological observation assumes a more pointed character. For it now attributes success or failure to the active center of the animal which controls these doings. Throughout the compass of biology, we find this relation between the observer and the subject. He is always critical of it. But as our study, ascending further, reaches that of man, a change comes over it. Already as we ascend from the more primitive to increasingly active and intelligent manifestations of animals, our indwelling in these has become more intimate. It offered scope for mutual affection between observer and the observed. But at the human level, we are facing not merely a lovable creature, but a person commanding respect. We may criticize him, but since we enter into equal fellowship with him, we acknowledge that we both share the same firmament of standards. Thus, thus, by a continuous expansion and intensification of the personal element of knowing, corresponding to rising levels of reality, we eventually pass from the I-it to the I-thou. Nor is the equality of status between the knower and the known the ultimate point in this progression. For the subject of our knowing may ascend still further and become our master. We then become apprenticed to our subject and learn to accept its criticism of ourselves. The writings of the great masters to the study of which the humanities are dedicators, dedicated, these studies offer ways of knowing a greatness to the example of which we entrust our judgment of ourselves. Here we see outlined the continuous transition between the natural sciences and the humanities, a transition which results in a complete reversal of the rel relative position between the knower and the known, namely, from an impersonal or critical to a respectfully guided attitude. Such is the range, I suggest, of valid knowing by the vindication of reality on all its levels. <laughs>